You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. There is no substitute for victory. I accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. We are Americans. I ask for your prayers and your support as our country continues its vital role as a leader for world peace. Well, I believe there's a better way of eliminating the threat of nuclear war. The future doesn't belong to the faint heart. It belongs to the brave. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. The following pre-recorded political program is sponsored by TV for Goldwater Miller on behalf of Barry Goldwater, Republican candidate for President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, we take pride in presenting a thoughtful address by Ronald Reagan. I have spent most of my life as a Democrat. I recently have seen fit to follow another course. I believe that the issues confronting us cross party lines. One week before the presidential election of 1964, Ronald Reagan delivered a 27-minute speech for television endorsing Republican candidate Barry Goldwater. Winston Churchill said the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. And he said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. Barry Goldwater has faith in us. He has faith that you and I have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions and determine our own destiny. Although Goldwater lost the election in a landslide to incumbent Democrat Lyndon Johnson, Ronald Reagan's powerful speech had won the hearts and minds of many in his party. And at age 53, the veteran actor had come upon his own rendezvous with destiny. As fate would have it, Ronald Reagan had played his first major role in what was to become a legendary career in American politics. Officially, Reagan's political career began in 1966 when he announced his intention to run for governor of California against Pat Brown, who was running on the Democratic ticket for a third consecutive term. When asked by his party to run against the man who had won over former Vice President Richard Nixon four years earlier, Reagan was skeptical. I'm an actor, not a politician, he said. Nevertheless, influential friends and party members persevered and eventually Reagan was convinced to run, even though he had never run for a position in public office before. When election time came in November of 1966, Reagan upset his opponent and was elected governor of California by a substantial margin. He won by a million votes, which would be the equivalent of winning by about two million votes now against a guy who was one of the best politicians in the state, had beaten Richard Nixon you know, four years earlier. Uh, 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 that was one uh, heck of a way to start your political career. In January of 1967, Ronald Reagan was sworn in as California's 33rd governor. Ronald Reagan was not, in my view, a good governor at first. We asked him uh, what kind of a governor he would be. You know, he had this wonderful sense of humor, and he says, I don't know, I've never played a governor. Actually, uh, uh, it proved a pretty demanding role. Reagan's first term extended through one of the most tumultuous times in American history. The years of post-war prosperity had given way to an era of internal dissent as issues of civil rights and the escalating war in Vietnam ignited a wildfire of social unrest throughout the country. California was no exception. Much of Reagan's first term was devoted to restoring order to college campuses across the state as schools such as the University of California at Berkeley became battlegrounds for student demonstrations that often resulted in violent confrontations with authority. In other areas of policy, Reagan was quite effective in state finances and was able to transform the deficit he inherited from Pat Brown into a state surplus. Reagan also introduced various business methods that helped improve legislative efficacy. By 1969, his approval ratings were high and he was elected to another term. He was simultaneously an ideologue and a pragmatist. He, was a, he wouldn't allow you to call him a politician, but he was a very, very good politician. He was a practical politician. And I think that most people 
uh, would agree that he was a successful governor in his second year. He put aside more parklands, by the way, than any governor except Earl Warren in the history of the state. And what is most important is that he became a steadily better governor. He was a better governor in his second term than he was in his first. Reagan's second term as governor extended through four years many Americans would like to forget. It was the time of the OPEC oil embargo, America's humiliating defeat in Vietnam, and the first time in history that an American president resigned in disgrace. Despite the country's woes, Reagan's California prospered, and after accomplishing most of what he set out to do, Reagan left Sacramento at the outset of 1975 and retreated to his ranch in Santa Barbara, California at age 63. However, Reagan's political respite was short-lived, and his supporters soon called upon him to serve once again, this time as a candidate for the highest office in the United States. On November 20th, I announced my decision to seek the Republican nomination for the presidency. He I was showing these half-hour television shows late at night, challenging President Ford, and he won the North Carolina primary. Once he did that, he became a competitor for the nomination because as the nominating process moved west and south in the Reagan country, he did very well. And he came up 117 votes short. I would be honored on your behalf to ask my good friend, Governor Reagan, to say a few words at this time. He came down where he was cheered after losing, he was, and he gave a speech, and he didn't have any notes. And his speech is about the great danger that faces the world is nuclear war. We live in a world in which the great powers have poised and aimed at each other horrible missiles of destruction, nuclear weapons that can in a matter of minutes arrive in each other's country and destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. But that is not the speech of a guy who uh, uh, is retiring to his ranch. And there was never any doubt in the minds of any of us who knew Reagan that he was going to run again for president. We must go forth from here united, determined that what a great general said a few years ago is true. There is no substitute for victory. Mr. President. Gerald Ford lost the presidency to Jimmy Carter. And four years later, Ronald Reagan sought the GOP nomination once again, this time with different results. With a deep awareness of the responsibility conferred by your trust, I accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. Reagan's bid for the presidency came at a time when the nation's collective confidence seemed to be running desperately low. 51 American hostages were still held in Iran after Iranian protesters seized the American embassy in November of 1979. The threat of nuclear devastation struck fear in the hearts of all Americans, and record unemployment, staggering interest rates, and inflation crippled the national economy. When he set out in 1980 in the campaign to revitalize the economy at a time when we were in our worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, uh, when he set out to rebuild our national defense uh, at a time when our armed forces had deteriorated uh, considerably, and when he set out to restore America's position of leadership when we were really down in the dumps as far as the rest of the world was concerned, I think people uh, resonated uh, to that. Everywhere I travel in America today, I hear this phrase over and over again. Everything is going up. Where is it going to end? Record inflation has robbed the purchasing power of your dollar. And for three and a half years, this administration has been unable to control it. When President Ford left office at the end of 1976, the inflation rate was around 5%. Jimmy Carter told us that was too high, much too high. Well, this year, Carter inflation has hit 18%. I'm very worried, as all Americans are, and I'm prepared to do something about it. As the presidential race entered the home stretch, Reagan and Carter squared off in a televised debate one week before the election. Governor Reagan, again, typically is against such a proposal. Governor, <laughs> there you go again. Throughout the debate, Reagan's presence overshadowed Carter, and his closing statement struck a resounding chord in America's conscience. Next Tuesday is election day. Next Tuesday, all of you will go to the polls who stand there in the polling place and make a decision. I think when you make that decision, it might be well if you would ask yourself, are you better off 
than you were four years ago? The polls on the weekend before the election were dead even. I'm not just talking about Carter's polls or the national polls. I'm talking about Ronald Reagan's polls. People right up to the weekend before the election weren't decided what they wanted to do. And then that Sunday before the election, the Ayatollah Khomeini pushed one more time against Jimmy Carter and everyone said, that's it. That's it, Jimmy. Go on home to Georgia. We're going to elect Ronald Reagan. He won by a large majority. And he brought to the office his political ideology and philosophy, which he understood full well. And it was part of his political strength. You knew where Ronald Reagan stood. He told you what he wanted to do with the presidency before he came, and he made every effort to do it once he got there. It is my intention to curb the size and influence of the federal establishment and to demand recognition of the distinction between the powers granted to the federal government and those reserved to the states or to the people. If we look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth. It was because here in this land, we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. It does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you. Thank you On the day of his inauguration, President Reagan made an announcement that every American so longed to hear. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free. Of After 444 long days in captivity, the hostages arrived on American soil and received a hero's welcome. Only two months after his inauguration, President Reagan was shot in the chest during an assassination attempt while leaving the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C. by 25-year-old John Hinckley. When he was shot, he says to his wife, and he almost died, Honey, I forgot the duck. And he says to the doctors, as they're about to put him under to try to remove this bullet, which was that close to his heart, well, I hope everybody in this room is Republican. And the doctors said, well, Mr. President, today all of us are Republicans. In fact, the chief doctor was a Democrat who saved his life. Reagan made a full recovery, yet his press secretary, James Brady, suffered severe head wounds that resulted in permanent brain damage. Twelve days after the shooting, Reagan returned to the White House, poised and ready to implement his next big move, a tax cut that he hoped would stoke the fires of business and put the American economy back on track. Our bill is, in short, the first real tax cut for everyone in almost 20 years. Our bipartisan bill gives a 25% reduction over three years. The bill called for a 25% cut in individual tax rates and major cuts for oil producers and other big